Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening uh, service. Let's take our Bibles and open them to Hebrews chapter 11. We were just there this morning with Brother Fennel. Uh, if you have not uh, seen that uh, message, I encourage you to do so. And also look into uh, the mission agency uh, that he is uh, representing. A lot of good information on their website. And the website's in the description section of that video, this morning's uh, message, this morning's sermon. I'm going to go a little bit different direction than what he did. We'll be in the same passage, Hebrews 11, <clears throat> and we'll read the first six verses. Uh, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, bringing us together again this evening. We pray that you'll meet with us. Bless the, the time that we spend in your word, the time we spend in your house. God, we pray that uh, uh, tonight's message, tonight's study will be a help and a blessing not just to those that are here, but to those that will be viewing later uh, by way of YouTube. It might uh, strengthen them, draw them closer to you, before we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's not going to be so much of a sermon as it is going to be uh, a little bit more instructional. Um, <clears throat> I in enjoy learning things as I read through the Bible, and I've, I've been saved for a very long part of my life, 40 uh, let's see, 47 years, 48 years or so uh, now uh, that I've known Christ as my Savior, and yet uh, there's still so much for me to learn in the Bible. And, and tonight's going to be a, a simple thing, um, something that I noticed this morning as Brother Fennel was preaching, and I've read through this passage many, many times, uh, more than, than I could remember to count. Uh, I've preached from Hebrews 11 many times. Uh, we refer to it as the great hall of faith uh, in the Bible. And uh, so many people, their tes the testimony of their faith, and of course the message that Brother Fennel brought this morning about uh, uh, some things about faith. And, and yet in all these times, I just kind of glossed over it. And we've got to be very careful as, as we read the Bible, uh, you'll find that... Uh, the next time you read through it, you'll find so many areas that you just kind of, you just kind of glossed over. You just kind of, you, you read through them, you just passed over that, and then you landed and focused on uh, maybe a phrase or a few uh, words or a selection of words or maybe even just a few verses in, in that chapter. I've, I've had a, a Sunday school lesson material where it says, okay, we're going to study uh, this chapter of, of this uh book and then it says this is the key verse in that chapter and uh, I often think how dangerous that could be for us to say there's one verse that's key and the rest of them aren't all that important and we need to remember that every word in the Bible all scripture is given by inspiration of God it, it's been God breathed God breathed these words uh, through uh through men that he had chosen, holy men of old, men that he had set aside for this particular task, uh, for them to be used as pens by him. And so God picked up different men and wrote different things. And, and he, he picked up a man named Matthew and wrote the gospel according to Matthew. And same thing with, uh, with Luke and so on and so forth. He used Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. So that was the pen that he chose to, to use to write those books. He used David to write uh, a majority of the Psalms, and he used Solomon to write a majority of, uh, of Proverbs. And so many, many different men uh, that God used, 
these aren't things that they came up with or they decided to write or something that occurred to them one day and they decided to write it down. These are the very words of God that he used those men to write. God wrote these words using those men to do it. And so knowing that and keeping that as, as a, a fundamental foundational belief, we need to understand that every single word then is there on purpose. Every single uh, mark, the, Jesus said that uh, uh, every jot and tittle would be preserved and protected. And so if God's that interested in even the punctuation and the smallest uh, uh, writings, the s smallest pieces of writing, uh, that he's going to preserve them, um, then we need to be sure that we're careful to understand it, to read it, and to not just fly over something. One of the things, one of the uh, pitfalls that we fall into in reading the Bible is when we use our own forms of speech or manner of speech or way of speaking and and there's words that we may use many times that really are hollow empty words they're words of no meaning and it seems like each generation comes up with a group or set of, of words that they use as filler words words that have no meaning uh, words that uh, if you were to study and how to give a speech, they'd be on a list, don't use these words. If you're gonna find yourself speaking in, in front of people, don't use these words. In the 80s, one of those words was, was totally. And that's a, uh, people totally misused that word and totally this and totally that. And, and then it moved on to like, and it's like this and it's like that. And, and people just used the word like as a filler word and it had no substance, it had no true meaning. They weren't comparing two things. They weren't saying this thing is like this. They weren't saying uh, that they were attracted to something. I like that. Uh, they were just using that word and it really had no meaning at all to it. And so sometimes we, we end up with those words that for us, they have no substance, they have no meaning. And if we carry that, I'm gonna call it a, um, well, I was going to call it something. I can't think of the word. A prejudice. We carry that preconceived idea, that prejudice with us as we read the Bible and apply that prejudice as we read. Here's a word that doesn't mean anything. Well, let me tell you something. All of these words are God-breathed. They are all here on purpose. There's not any of them that have no meaning. God purposefully put every single one of these words in here. And, and so when we have a word that to us in our usage doesn't have all that meaning, uh, all that much meaning, then as we read this, the tendency is to carry that with us. And we see that word here and we say, well, to me, that word doesn't have all that much meaning. And we got to be careful not to do that. And for from the very beginning, Satan has been attacking God's words. And he does that directly as, as recognizing them as God's words and then trying to change them and modify them uh, or replace them with other words. But then at the, on the other, another way that he attacks the words is to try to change the very definition of those words. And so he's going he's gonna to take a word that's, that has a specific definition and change its meaning. For example, uh, the word gay has, you can look that word up. It means to be happy it, uh, and um, just in, in an overall good mood. And he has taken that word and perverted its meaning and applied it to something completely different. Uh, for us as Christians, the, the symbol of the rainbow is a symbol that God is not going to destroy the planet, the whole planet, by way of a flood ever again. He did so once, but he's not ever going to do it again. And yet Satan has co-opted that symbol and used it and applied it to the realm of homosexuality. And, and uh, uh, I would imagine that many of them don't know how they are just uh, thumbing their nose at God by using that uh, for something that he has called an abomination. And so one of the things that he does in the versions of the Bible that he puts out is he replaces those words. He, repla he replaces a word that has a specific definition, the word sodomite, 
and he, he puts in different words that have different meanings and different definitions, or he, he changes the way we use a word. So we're going to look at, at, at one word here in chapter 11 that I would imagine most of us, we've all read it if you read along tonight, and if this is not the first time you've been in Hebrews chapter 11, then you've read it at other times as well. And perhaps many, many times um, in hearing sermons uh, over the years, not just for myself, but other preachers, missionaries, evangelists, and pastors. And it's the very first word in chapter 11, now. And I have to be honest, this morning <clears throat> was the first time that I read through this passage and that I noticed that word. It's such a small word. It's such a simple word. It's, it's a word that we, we say, well, now I'm going to do this or, or now let's see here. And it really, in the way we use it, so often it doesn't really contribute to the conversation. It doesn't contribute to the meaning. It doesn't contribute to anything in it. I looked the word up in, in the Greek. In the Greek, it's even smaller. It's just two letters. And as I was studying about it, it said it's often not used. In English, it said it's a, a primary particle. And so then I had to look up what is a primary particle. And I'm still not positive what a primary particle is. It, they had, uh, uh, here's particles. You can look a particle in grammar. and But you have to really start digging deep to find out what a primary particle is. And I think it said most particles can also be used as prepositions. Um, and... It listed examples of them. Every time it listed an example, it didn't even list the word now. And it says this is not this is not usually used in English. And yet, God made sure to put it in there. And that word has a very definitive meaning. And I wrote, I, I circled this word in my Bible and I wrote out next to it. And I said, I... I really want to share this with us. Whenever I get something new from the Bible, I want to make sure and share it. And uh, that way God knows he can keep giving me new things and trust that they're going to be given out. It doesn't cost anything. When you get something from the Bible and you share it with somebody else, you're not left with less than what you had to begin with. Now, look at this. And there I use the word now. Faith, what this tells me, since I look at this and say, you know what? That word is in there on purpose. God could have very easily just left it out. Would it have changed the meaning? Yes, it would have. Because when we look at every word being there on purpose and we take one out, we omit one, then that purpose is not being fulfilled and the meaning gets changed. But he said, now. That tells me faith is a now thing. It's something we're supposed to have right now. Not something we're supposed to work towards having someday. Now we can work towards having more faith someday. We can, we can start implementing things now for our faith to grow. But we're supposed to have faith now. Right now. Faith is a, it's not a, a, well I used to have faith. We're supposed to have faith now. Now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It's a very wonderful thing. He, he, he starts out, the very thing that Christians get attacked on is, well, uh, God didn't create everything. There was a big bang, and that's how we all got here. And he says, faith is what we use to tell us where we came from. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. Faith is what is telling you where you came from. And people accuse Christians of having faith. You've never seen God. Well, let me, let me say this. You've never seen the Big Bang. So the atheists or the so-called atheist, a person who will refer to themselves as an atheist, say, I don't believe in God at all. I believe we evolved from monkeys. Well, you know what? Nobody has ever seen that. That's, 
they are, that is guiding their life and the way they make their decisions is evidence of something that they have not themselves seen. And so faith, the, the way the Bible begins to describe it and says, here's, if you want to know what faith is, but faith is what you use to tell you where you came from. And so somebody who says, I don't believe faith should be taught in school. Okay, then you have to eliminate every mention and every reference to evolution in the school. Because that is a faith. It's not a deistic faith per se, but the Bible tells us that their rock is not our rock. And they believe that everything came, you know, water. I, I just uh, I have a hard time understanding where the water came from. Because according to them, everything exploded. It was a big, giant mass of swirling dust. And it just started to swirl. And as it swirled, it, it coalesced into these balls everywhere, planets and moons. And, and then um, they just sat there in outer space for who knows how long. And then water formed out of that dust. And then that water, there was, there was waves and it started beating on the rocks. The, you know, in some areas, the rocks formed out of the dust. In some areas, somehow water formed out of the dust. And the water beat on the rocks. And then somewhere, it just kind of made this primordial soup. And lightning hit that soup and it created. And good night. That takes a lot of faith because none of those things have ever been observed. And they tell us, well, nobody's ever seen God. Well, by faith, by faith, people acted and God came through for them. And he gets, starts a whole list of people. And then he says, you know what? We could, there wouldn't be enough time to write about everybody that God had worked in their lives through faith. Um, but here's just some highlights of them. Here's, here's the all-stars of the faith. And he, he starts out very beginning, by faith, Abel. Abel started living his life by faith. It cost him his life. His faith cost him his life. He offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was translated. And so Enoch got to go uh, to heaven with God without seeing death uh, because he walked with God. Here it says the report was he pleased God. And then uh, <clears throat> by faith, Noah. There was only three men mentioned that uh, lived before the flood in, in the hall of faith here. And then everybody else mentioned came after uh, Noah's flood. But listen, faith is a now thing. Well, when I understand more, I'll have more faith. That's, that, I'm going to put that off till later. No, faith is a now thing. If God's asking you to do something, you need to do it now by faith. Why wouldn't you want to please God? See, it takes faith. Whatever you do has to be sprinkled with faith in order for that to be pleasing to God. And not just, not just generic and general faith, but faith in God. Obedience to his command. And all obedience to his commands are going to require faith. This morning we studied about um, the Israelites leaving Israel uh, leaving Egypt, I'm sorry, and crossing the Red Sea. And just prior to crossing the Red Sea, they had to go through a ceremony uh, that God had just then implemented. It became known as the Passover. And they had to take a lamb and set that lamb aside for a certain amount of days and observe it and make sure that it didn't have any sickness or disease, no blemish, no broken bones, nothing of the sort, a pure white lamb. And then they had to kill that lamb, and they had to collect its blood in a basin, take some hyssop, which was a common plant, a common weed, I guess, in the area, and use that to dip it in the blood and paint it on the doorpost and on the lintel above the door. Now, the thing about that is, in Egypt, the lamb, amongst other animals, was a sacred animal. And if you wanted to kill one of the sacred animals, you had to get permission from the priest that represented that particular God. And if you killed the animal without permission from the priest, without permission from that temple, it could be a death sentence for you. Now, these weren't people that were 
of high influence in society. They were the slaves, and so very easily to implement the death sentence among the slaves. And so by faith, they killed that lamb, trusting that God would save them, trusting that God would, would keep them alive and protect them from the enemy. So from the very beginning, what, what we don't understand about that society and the rules and the laws of that area, faith was being exercised way before we see it being exercised. Why? Because faith is a now thing. And it's something that we do now. There was a great danger to themselves, but they chose to obey God, no matter what the cost to themselves was. And that is one of the, one of the key signs of faith being put into place, being put into action by faith. Now, faith is. Not faith will be or faith was. It gives us a list of people from the past that exercise their faith and and just a, a brief statement about it. But for us and for them at the time, faith is very much a right now thing. God is the God of right now. He's got control of the future just as much as he always had control of the past. But he's a God of right now. He said, I am. Identify me as the I am that I am. God says today is the day of salvation. God's very much the God of now and our faith in him needs to be very much a now faith. Let's stand and we'll close with a word of prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word in its totality, but also your words in their individuality. God, help us to be careful to not just pass over words that for us personally in, in our use may have little to no meaning, not much substance. Help us to realize all your words are there on purpose. And as we read and study your Bible, may we be careful to do so in a studious way, to study, to show ourselves approved, to look at them and allow your word to speak to us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who will guide us and teach us from your word. Help us to always look to him. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross to pay the price for our sins that we could be saved and can see you face to face someday where our faith will be made sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless and keep.